Today our scripture is from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I'll be reading from verses 26 through 43. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 43. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man who had devils a long time, wore no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the God Most High? I beseech you, torment me not. For Jesus had commanded that the unclean spirit come out of him. For oftentimes it caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters. And he broke the bands and was driven by the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were in him. And they besought that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was a herd of many swine on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into the swine, and he suffered them. And the devils went out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake, and they were choked. And when those who fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. And then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also who saw it told them by what means the possessed one of the devils was healed. And then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear, and he went into a ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. And Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and show how great things God has done for you. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city the great things that Jesus had done to him. And God had God's blessing to this reading of the word. The country of the Gatherings obviously was not a Jewish town, otherwise they wouldn't be raising swine. And we're told this story of Jesus comes to the shore and Jesus had just, in some accounts, Jesus had just calmed the storm. Jesus had just demonstrated to his disciples what, what manner of, of person he was, that indeed he was the Son of God. And he comes to the shore and this man possessed of demons runs up to him. What do we have to do with you, Jesus, Son of God Most High? There are other accounts of this same story in the book. Uh, in the book of Mark, we are only told of a man being possessed of one demon, whereas here it tells us that there were many demons. In the book of Matthew, it's two men. Very unusual. In the book of Matthew, it's two men. You can see how the impression was that I've had people say, well, there's no miracle being discussed here. This man was obviously mentally ill. The man was obviously bipolar. And I said, well, then a miracle has still occurred since when was what was the last time you saw a herd of bipolar pigs running off a cliff? <laughs> Interesting story. The details of this story really, really strike me. First of all, the demons knew who Jesus was. What do we have to do with you? We know you are Son of the Most High God. And Jesus, in many accounts, the demons would try to identify him and Jesus would prevent them from speaking. James said, oh, you believe in God? Well, big deal. The demons believe in God and they tremble and indeed they do believe. So it's more than just believing. But the demons know who he is and they don't want to just be thrown into nothingness. Let us go into the swine. And Jesus does allow it. And of course, the, they run off the swine, run off the cliff and are killed and the, the pig herders have lost all of their money. The pig herders have lost their investment and the and they're in trouble with the people that own the herd. All kind of bad things have happened. And when
when they go to tell the people in the town about what has occurred, they all come out. And what do they find? First of all, let's consider that you had a man who was running around with no clothes on in the graveyard, and they could chain this guy, and he was so strong and so wild, he could break the chains. And everyone is afraid to go anywhere near this guy because he's a madman. He's crazy. He's dangerous. Jesus has driven the, the demons out, and what do they find when they get there? They find them in clothes, in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the teachings. And what's the very next thing it says? And they were afraid. They were afraid. This is the, the madman that they couldn't get anywhere close to because he's crazy. He just got to watch out for this guy. And now he has been healed. The demons are gone and entered into the pigs. And, and the man is now clothed and in his right mind and, and able to be a productive citizen of, the, of society. And they're afraid. And they say, Jesus, get out of here. Everybody says, leave. Isn't that strange? I don't know that it is all that strange. I remember when I was growing up in Plant City United Methodist Church in Plant City, Alabama. A little sliver of a town between Lynette and Shawnee, which were little slivers of a town. We used to do this thing, we would call, I forget what we call them, encounters or missions. Or, uh, you'd basically, a youth group from some other church would come into your church and there would be activities and singing and worship and prayer and and, and studies, and the next thing you know, all of the children would be caught up in the fervor. All of the children in the church, all the young people would suddenly, and it's a weird thing, you know, because we grew up in church and think we're Christians. Well, yeah, kind of. We were there because we grew up in church and we were all used to being in church, but somehow there was another level of saved, wasn't there? There was another level of saved where you're going to church and you know the stories and this kind of stuff, and then somebody comes along and says, you need to be inspired and filled with the Holy Spirit and you and you repent of all those sins that you've been hiding and you of all the pears that you stole from next door or whatever it happens to be. You know, I remember one of the sins I had to repent of multiple times is we found a dead crow in the yard. Me and my friends found a dead crow in the yard and we put this dead crow. We said, well, you know, wouldn't it be cool to have a skeleton? So we take this dead crow and we drop him in a paint can and we, 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 we hammer the, the paint can lid shut and then we go under the church and we suspend this thing over a ditch from a pipe so that it's not touching anything thinking that, that is going to, that's going to make it where it doesn't get et up and consumed rather it's just going to rot away in some magical mystical form or we're going to have a mummified crow or we're going to have a crow skeleton or something else like this. And, of course, we could explain to everybody why oh, that church stunk <laughs> so bad. And it got worse for a couple of weeks, and then suddenly it stopped, you know. I'm going, I'm going to a family reunion soon. I think I'll go back to that church and go under there and see if I can see where the is still there. Kids have all kinds of sins they need to repent of, don't they? But we would get inspired, and we would be weeping down the aisle at the altar, you know, at the Methodist churches they have an altar. And, and we would be inspired, you know, to, 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 uh, to, to witness or to go on a mission trip ourselves. And people in the church, in the church, parents, <coughs> relatives, some friends are sitting there and they're looking at you and they're saying, this is just not right. You know, you used to be such a nice person. You used to be so much fun. You used to. You're just not the same person. And they get kind of afraid of that. They're kind of like wishing that you'd go back to what you were. It's weird, isn't it? But it's true. When our children, when our friends, when, when people get another dose of religion and all of a sudden they're they're inspired to read the scripture. They're inspired to pray at the drop of a hat. They're inspired to, to study for ministry or something like that. Too often we say, no, this is something right. You're, 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 you'll get over this. You'll, 
You'll get past it. You'll, it'll, it'll change. This is not going to last. And, and we sit around and, and look for the first mistake and say, uh huh, uh huh. I knew you was the same old person. I knew that nothing really happened to you. We, you know, better the devil you know than the Savior you don't sometimes, it seems. I mean, better to have the, the, the bratty kids that at least you know what to expect out of them than to have suddenly these new sainted wonders walking around and you don't know what they're going to do next. They're going to speak in tongues. They're going to try to heal each other. What are they doing? You don't know. Here's a man who has been a wild man who has been, had many reasons to be fearful and now he's in his right mind and he's clothed and he's, he's behaving well and now all of a sudden the Gadarenes are afraid and tell Jesus to leave the town. Are we afraid of good things? Are we afraid of the Holy Spirit when it actually takes a hold of somebody? Are we afraid when our children suddenly get religion and they, they, want, to, they want to witness or they want to sing or they want to study ministry or whatever it is? They want to have a family Bible study? Do we kind of say, no, nah, you know, let's, yeah, you know don't, don't get too... Don't get too on your, you know, don't get on your high horse, so to speak. Don't, don't get all worked up about this. You know, sometimes we're like the gatherings. You've got somebody that's closer to God and in their right mind and healed, and we don't know what to do with that. We just assume go back like they were, which wasn't all that bad. You know, at least when he was naked and in the graveyard, we all knew where he was, and we knew to stay away from there hear him yelling until we knew what was going on. Very interesting. They've asked Jesus to leave. What does Jesus do? He leaves. He leaves. He's not going to stay where he's not wanted. You know, he sent out the disciples two by two and said, if you go into town and they reject you, then, then shake the dust off your shoes. Take the dust off your feet. Be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for those men. Jesus was all about it. If they don't want to hear your gospel, if they don't want to hear the word, then move on. You don't have time to waste on them. Go somewhere else. So Jesus says, all right, that's fine. I'll leave when he gets in the boat to leave. And then the man that he had driven the demons out of comes running up trying to get in the boat. He wants to go with him. He wants to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Isn't that a good thing? Shouldn't we want to follow Jesus? That's what this guy wants. And what did Jesus do? Jesus gave him a tougher assignment. Jesus gave him something more difficult to do. No, I'm, I'm traveling and, I, and I'm homeless and, and I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be persecuted and killed and my disciples are all going to be killed and, and I appreciate that you are glad that you're healed and that you're grateful and that you want to follow me, but I've got a tougher assignment for you. Go home. Go home and testify to the great things that God has done for you. Go home. So now this man who used to be crazy has to go home. And, and, and now he's got to watch his temper because every time he loses his temper, people are going to say, oh, here he goes, here he goes. Oh, you know, watch him. He's going to take his clothes off. He's going to go back out into the, into the tombs. Oh, look out. You know, his old temper is coming back. I mean, now all of a sudden he's got, to, he's, got to, he's got to witness to and testify to the very same people that he was once such a threat to. Like an angry father who gets religion <laughs> And now he's got to be easy. It'd be, it'd be a cinch to leave town and become an evangelist out there where nobody knows you. It's a lot tougher to go home and face the same children that you used to yell at, that you used to lose your temper with, that you used to leave home alone, and now you got to convince them that you're changed and that you're a different person. It's, it's not as easy. You go into the same classmates that you've always been, been, uh, been making fun of their religion and putting them down and being a skeptic and being sarcastic and now all of a sudden you've got to talk to them like faith matters to you and like you know the Lord. And 
And they're going to be skeptical. Your children would be skeptical. Your spouse, the same spouse that you've been so mean to. Not you. <laughs> Present company, except The same spouse. The same loved ones that have put up with that have put up with us when we were mad men, that have put up with us when we were tearing the chains off and tearing our clothes off and running around in the graveyard. Now all of a sudden, they're supposed to believe that we're saved. And you're going to have to demonstrate that for a long time to demonstrate to people like that. It was easy to put together a mission team and to go off into another church and act all kind of holy and righteous and stir things up and then you leave and now they're all saved and trying to get religious and everything else and, and they think of you as y'all do. Some saint came in here and did all this. You know, it's easy to leave town. It's easy to jump in the boat with Jesus and go off to Jerusalem. Not as easy to go home and witness to your own family. The last part of that, of course, I love too, is that Jesus had said, go home to your own family and tell them about the great things that God has done for you. And then the very next verse says, and so he went and told them about what Jesus had done for him. Your children, the youth of this church, and we need to go gather up Stephen, by the way. Wigan, would you go get Stephen for me, please? Our young people. <laughs> Sam and Jack. We even Stephen. Yes, even Chris and me. You're young people. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to uh, going to Fort Pierce. I understand we'll be doing some painting and we'll be doing maybe some roofing or hanging some drywall or something like that. We'll also be doing some praying and some worshiping and some fellowshipping and some testifying. And we're able to do this because you have sent us. You have you've commissioned us. You have financed it. You have given us the permission. You have, you have bought the insurance. You've rented the van. We're ready to go. We're going out there. And as you well know, some kids, when they go off to camp or they go off to a mission trip or they go uh, and serve God, it changes them. It changes them. You know, wonderful as these young people are, they might come back different. They might come back a little more serious about their faith. They might come back a little more curious about Scripture. They might come back a little more ready to participate and to witness to others. They might. If they do, we don't want to say, well, Jake, you know, you were fine like you were. I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I like the new Sam or the new William or the new Stephen, the new Jack. I'm not saying that they need to be new. These are the most wonderful and committed Christians, these young people in this church, are the most wonderful and committed Christians I know. Amen. They are. I fully expect great things out of every one of them. I do. But we have to remember that God does things that we don't expect. And God can change you. And God can grow you. And God can suddenly move. And we have to give God room to move. And so regardless of whether they come back the same or different, regardless of whether they decide to be ministers or carpenters or engineers or teachers or whatever it is that they're going to do with their lives, you're invited and encouraged to receive what God does for them, with them, and through them. Chris, would you come forward? Yeah. William, Stephen, <laughs> come forward to it. Right here.
children's mind. You can always can preach and talking about it. You can, and you know what you're talking about. And, and I'm proud of you. Chris, God sent you to this church. I am so pleased that you're here to partner with us in ministry. That you're leading these children. And have you seen the kid group that's going to be the youth group of tomorrow? You're in serious trouble, my friend. <laughs> Get ready. You better be all prayed up. You better be all prayed up. So we've only got six. But tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. Tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. We're all going to get the roads. We're going to be ready to go. You're going to get all packed up today, right? You're going to be here at the church. You're going to be out there. We're going to pray. And we're going to sing. And we're going to work. And we're going to take a week. We're going to take six days to fellowship with God. And to let someone else steer us and help us and teach us to be missionaries to Fort Pierce. Okay? So, let's get commissioned. Do you believe in your heart that God has called you to serve in Fort Pierce? If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. Are you willing to take these new responsibilities in service for Christ? If so, say, I am. I am. Will you seek to share with those around you the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is reconciliation with God, forgiveness of sins, the power for righteous and holy living as children of God? If so, please say, God helping us, we will. God helping us, we will. Congregation, please stand. As you are able. You have heard the nature of the work which Stephen and William, Sam, Jack, and Chris will be engaged in. In many ways, you're going with us. We'll stay in touch. We'll let you know what's going on. As they resume uh, this responsibility, we need your assurance that you will pray, that you will remember, and that you will welcome them home. You are willing to repeat after me. We've heard of your commitment. We thank God for your obedience. Through the call of God's Spirit and the commissioning of the church. Through the call of God's Spirit and the commissioning of the church. Servants of Christ are scattered throughout the world. Servants of Christ are scattered throughout the world. We accept your service in Fort Pierce. We accept your service in Fort Pierce. As an extension of the ministry of this congregation. As an extension of the ministry of this congregation. We pledge our supporting prayers. We pledge our supporting prayers. May your ministry be effective. May your ministry be effective. May the Lord watch over us. May the Lord watch over us. May the Holy Spirit guide us. May the Holy Spirit guide us. While we're absent with one another. While we're absent with one another. You may be seated. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and of His church. On behalf of the mission agency, we commission you in this service in Fort Pierce. May God bless you and make you a blessing. In Jesus' precious name we pray.